we're really fortunate that we have uh, a fabulous series of panelists this evening, and they'll be introduced in a minute. Uh, but just a little bit about Cornell. Some of you uh, know a little bit about us, but uh, we moved into the former Standard Oil building about a year ago. Um, many of my students are on the other end of the floor. Uh, they actually have a big design review coming up, so we may or may not see them tonight. So they may wander in a little bit, but uh, they're pretty busy under pressure. We're coming to the end of our semester here, so uh, everyone is quite uh, active. Um, so again, we're very happy that you're here. Uh, I want to introduce Roland Lewis, and all, of course, many of you know Roland from uh, his years of service, almost 10 years now with the uh, Waterfront Alliance. And of course, he's a, a long, lifelong New Yorker and has been involved in a lot of community organizations, and uh, his leadership is exemplary. So we're very happy to have you back again this evening and looking forward to tonight's dialogue. And of course, we're going to be here for a couple more Wednesdays, so uh, if you like what you see tonight, please make sure you keep coming back. We'd love to have you here. And also, a lot of our Cornell events uh, will be coming up over the next few months also, and we're posting those. Uh, typically in the Architect's Diary, as well as a number of other uh, channels throughout Cornell. So, again, welcome this evening. All right, well, good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. I am Roland Lewis, and the president of the Waterfront Alliance, and we're just so pleased to be here once again at Cornell's facility. And Bob, thank you for the hospitality, and it's, again, for the, I see a few repeat customers here, and <laughs> I'm enjoying it up here pretty regularly too. But uh, for those who are first time here, I'm sure you're as uh, dumbfounded and uh, amazed at the, what a great facility this is, and uh, the, the view itself, but also the good work that goes on here with the, with the academics and the, and the students. Um, this is the fourth of uh, six of our deep dive series. And I, again, there are a number of uh, repeat deep divers. Um, uh, we will building up toward our conference. So again, if you uh, if you enjoy what you hear at the deep dive, I think you'll uh, really love uh, that concentrated wonderfulness at the conference on May 12th on the boat. Uh, so please, if you haven't registered already, please register soon. Uh, tickets are going fast, and uh, we want to have you there to be part of those dialogues as well. Um, I think most of, some of you, I hopefully all of you know the Waterfront Alliance. Uh, a, a, an alliance of over uh, 900 different civic organizations, and uh, the the top, top and, and also businesses. The topic today is sort of central to what we care about and think about: how to create greater stewardship and activation at the water's edge. And you couldn't have a better panel to uh, discuss this uh, material. Uh, uh, all all good friends and allies of the of the Waterfront Alliance for many years, fighting good fights. Um, and struggles, and I think we learned from those uh, struggles, and we'll be hearing about those today. And so, without uh, further ado, you heard about the the uh, uh, you're using your computer machines to uh, partake in this uh, 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 real time question and answer. It's it's amazing. I, w I would be remiss if I don't uh, recognize my colleague Jose Sogard right here, quietly keeping time, and he'll have a quick uh, note at the very end. But he's been one putting these things together, and also putting together a conference. Um, did I forget anything, Jose? Join us on Twitter. What's that? Join us on Twitter. And oh, join us on, yeah, tweet all you want. <laughs> uh, you can use your computer machine. So uh, I'll ask uh, Jessica Fain, currently of uh, the Department of City Planning, heading over to uh, the, the Center for Resiliency. What, what, did Jamaica, what did it call it again? The Science and Resiliency Institute at Jamaica Bay. Exactly, the Science and Resiliency <laughs> Institute at Jamaica Bay. Uh, it's uh, their, their, their gain and, and DCP's loss, but uh, a great a um, expert, advocate, and uh, servant for the waterfront. So Jessica, why don't you come up? Big hand for Jessica. Uh, great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, uh, as Roland mentioned, my name is Jessica Thane. I am a planner, a waterfront planner at the Department of City Planning. And um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about waterfront stewardship and hear about all these great projects that are going on on our waterfront. And oftentimes government is sort of seen as the folks that make projects go slower or make projects, you know, inch along. I know. But I just want to, I want to take this as an opportunity to really say thank you to the folks on our um, panel today because what doesn't get said often enough is how grateful we are to folks like you who really inspire us and push us and motivate us to do 
um, more with our waterfronts and make them better places. So thank you for all your struggles and hard work, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about um, all the interesting and exciting work that you've been doing. Um, so I'm going to uh, just go through the um, a quick um, bios on each of our, our speakers. Uh, the first speaker um, will be uh, Roger Meyer, who is a public <coughs> space advocate for over 20 years, uh, having founded New York Outrigger, uh, the Liberty World Ch Challenge, and co-founder of the Conservancy North, which he currently serves as chair. In addition, he has produced waterfront policy documents, served uh, New York City as a brand strategist, and other city and state agencies in an effort to activate and protect the waterfront. And he'll share a little bit about um, waterfront stewardship zones and a new concept uh, um, that he's been uh, developing. Uh, next, uh, we will be joined by Carolina Salguero, uh, who is a, a Brooklyn patriot and native, a former photojournalist, um, whose award-winning globetrotting career ran from the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall through 9-11 in New York City. Um, after documenting change around the world, she dedicate, she's decided to trigger um, some back home. She's founded uh, the nonprofit Portside New York uh, with the goal of activating New York City's waterways and waterfronts and creating a maritime center, um, a living lab for better urban waterways. Portside also programs a historic ship, the Mary Whalen. Um, she and Portside won a White House award and a New York State Senate honors for Hurricane Sandy recovery work. Uh, Carolina is a member of the Red Hook uh, New York Rising Committee and the Sunset Park Task Force. And a Yale graduate and sailor with a captain's license, Carolina has been uh, photographing and boating and advocating for New York City's waterfront since 1998. Uh, following Carolina, we will be joined by uh, Dan Ping He, who was born and raised all of her life in uh, the Two Bridges neighborhood in the Lower East Side. Uh, she's been involved with community development in the neighborhood since high school, uh, providing direct services in youth development, financial empowerment, and affordable housing counseling. In February 2015, she joined the Two Bridges uh, Neighborhood Council as a project manager to advance the organization's built environment and community planning initiatives, which include waterfront development and resiliency planning. And then finally, uh, we'll hear from Matt Peritone, who is the owner and operator of Lehigh uh, Maritime and a partner at Brooklyn Barge Bar. Uh, he has used his experience in commercial tug operations and engineering background to create a waterfront access point for educational and commercial operations to better connect um, to people to New York City's waterways. Uh, a graduate in engineering from New York Maritime Associate, or Ac Academy, uh, he has worked uh, several years in large commercial tugboat companies in New York Harbor and the East Coast. He started out volunteering on ship restoration in 2004 and later purchased Tug Cornell to, um, appropriate considering where we are today, uh, to provide people with a connection to the working waterfront via tugboats. Uh, he purchased and converted several uh, deck barges um, for educational water access use on the Hudson River and New York Harbor with the latest version in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. So um, as you can tell, quite a breadth of experience in and on our waterways, and so I'm really um, excited to have everyone here today. So without further ado, um, Roger can kick us up. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you all. So the uh, idea that I'd like to put forth today is the Waterfront Community Stewardship Zones. And uh, this is a, a policy recommendation which uh, <coughs> folks at Conserv Conservancy North has uh, presented to city agencies as well as public space advocates to get their feedback. And this is the first time I'm speaking in public about this. And so it's a, this is a dialogue to get people's ideas. But this is based on 20 years of uh, trying to activate the waterfront. And this idea is in development stages. And uh, without further ado, let's jump in. Uh, I think the missing ingredient in terms of an equitable waterfront is small-scale entrepreneurialism in our communities, that it's viable possibilities to happen in the waterfront. Um, I've got some ideas. I want to paint a little bit of the dark picture, but not for too long. Uh, all the stuff everyone knows. It's, but it, it, it's the deepest part of that, yeah. So we've got our 520 miles of waterfront. There's some spectacular views. We've got some absolutely blissful moments of activation and access. Um, but we do not have waterfront cultures. Not in any deep sense. 
Uh, we have Rockaway and a few other places perhaps you can stretch your mind around it, but no neighborhood really is responsible for their waterfront. Uh, and therein is the problem, because we put a high premium on that creative, community-driven entrepreneurial energy, which has definitely transformed many, many communities. The state talks about this, the city talks about this. It is it's grassroots energy that is the, the thing that makes a place a tourist attraction and makes a place healthy and vibrant. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna look at a model to get beyond where we are today. So our, our most telling feature of, of our waterfront today is, is dis disembodied. And the disembodiedness comes from the relationship of the agencies to the community. Um, again, this is not an indictment. This is just simply try to find the, where the gears might mesh. Um, what we got here pretty much is compartmentalized activities. It kind of makes sense in a way. You know, we got a boathouse over here, we got esplanades over there, and we got you know a bar over there. But what's missing is the interrelated parts. Hence, a culture. And uh, salt marsh restoration, all the ingredients you need to make something grow. Okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, no surprise that this article just broke in a water wire that access is still a critical issue despite you know, all the great stuff that's been going on in terms of new uh, acreage. So the question is, city government wants great waterfronts, community want great waterfronts, but communities Entrepreneurs, which I'm going to keep on going back to, need the opportunity for self-direction, self-determination. This is a trend that's not going away. And it's, and it's hitting harder and harder that the communities want to be responsible as stakeholders and stewards of this planet. Again, this is not going away. This is a, an economic reality. The city needs efficiency and income, and that has to be addressed. And the waterfront needs care. But this is kind of a triple bottom line problem. So. Our idea is, like the maritime industrial zones, is to designate areas in the waterfront in all of our districts that are specific to public access, public engagement, and stewardship, and purposefully honeycomb entrepreneurial activities that specifically address these issues. And the thing that comes that comes to life when this when you see these moments and, and Matt experienced some of this when we did the Hudson Rising campaign in 2013 is that when you connect some of these dots together in other words you go to the waterfront you see a saltwater tank and you see canoes and kayaks and you see maybe somebody talk about the history of the place there's a little light that goes on on people's head that goes yes good the right thing and so it's, it's deeply it, it'll resonate with the educators policy people every folks this is a, so the basic idea of this, these um, spaces is that they're incubators. They welcome the community <coughs> with resources. They welcome with, with infrastructure. They're self-sustaining. That means there's some commercial component that keeps them going, whether it's a cafe, a bar, or it's like a, um, a fish market or a green market. It's always mixed use. Again, it's not one boathouse. It's activation. Access is not this one thing that we take a photograph of and put in our websites. It's an ongoing thing that continually interrelates with other activities. And it's community driven, and that's a mechanism onto itself that we have to talk about. So, this could be a barge, it could be a ship, a pierhead, upland structure. Uh, the key thing is that it can be as, as, uh, as limited as multiple shipping containers, or it can be um, integrated into a large residential complex. Either way, it involves many entities. The key DNA thing behind this whole idea is alignment. The problems that we've seen over and over and over is that there's been a, basically a breakdown with what the community wants and, what's, and, where the, and where the government goes with this. So the RFP has to be aligned with the concessionaire agreement. The operator has got to be on the same page. So that's, that is the, the critical ingredient. And the, the basic axioms, if you want to think of this as math, or the principle that, that our, this whole thing is based on is this, that all of our citizens are basically stewards and stakeholders of space, and consumers too. And so we, it's all about lifestyle choices. Two, we have to understand the environmental aspect of it. It's almost meaningless to have big spaces on the waterfront that don't address some issue of stewardship of taking care of the space. And three, the socio-economic potential of neighborhood waterfronts as a source of good jobs, environmental enhancement, tourism, and livability. I want to say one thing regarding livability. Um, cities today, that's what they compete on. The, the beautiful spaces that show this 
magnificent uh, innovation towards access where you can get to mountains and you can get to the water and you can do all different things. Boats are not this capital B boat, platonic boat. They're little, you know, all sorts of disciplines and all the activities. These are the things that attract people. And this is the thing that, that nibbles on New York City at all times. Uh, in New York, the bottom line is this is a buy, low, sell, high opportunity. We've got a great opportunity to really expand the waterfront for the community. Now, I'm going to draw some parallels. Um, urban farming. I suspect the growth of urban farming in the last 20 years has seen a lot of struggles. I suspect there's probably a lot of uh, bent noses out there for all the folks who want to do good things for the community, but whatever, all the gears weren't meshing, it was a bit of a challenge. So now states, uh, cities are coming together and, and states to protect these community investments. And I want to just, this is, I took this from the actual uh, uh, urban garden district for Cleveland, but they're trying to protect, to meet the needs of local food production, community health and education, job training, environmental enhancement, and green space preservation. Can we not cut and paste that for all of our neighborhoods? I mean, that's just, it just seems like a natural kind of framework to use for our food space. Uh, San Francisco decided to create incentives property in order to get a tax break for providing uninhabited land for urban farming. <coughs> Can we not do the same thing for developers? Let's get beyond the promenade thing on the waterfront zoning and let's get actual infrastructure so communities can continually activate it on their own terms. So I want to give you a couple of success models real quick and I'll wrap it up. Um, Seattle's Pike Place. It's not a perfect uh, model, but it's got a lot going on because it juggles this complex thing of generating income and being cemented with the community. It's got what the um, general manager I spoke with last uh, yesterday, in fact, said to me, it's, it's a permeable, permeable boundaries. And he explained that when we want to get a high dose of revenue, we move the thing in private mode where it becomes a place for events at a certain time, and then we go full on community. It's uh, all about local, it's not Starbucks. It's, it's all about helping community members um, keep their businesses going. It's mandated by a charter to provide low income, to provide services to low income and incubate small business. Again, the incubator small business thing is the key thing. And as the uh, general manager says, it's all about nourishing the soul of Seattle, trying to keep it a place that the residents feel at home with. And it also generates revenue, 16 million a year. Close to home, Pier 66 Maritime. Uh, I've been preaching the, the, uh, the benefits of this uh, entity for, for 20 years now, and I don't think historically we have our hands around what's actually gone on with this thing. But I'm going to try to like, get at some of its DNA real quick. Um, just real quick, I, I showed up on the shores of that, <coughs> where that barge was in 1996. I've been getting thrown out in the parks because I wanted to start a canoe club. We had a canoe there for a brief time, uh, and the dock masters changed hand, and the guy couldn't relate to the idea of having canoes in a marina. So. I went to uh, Chelsea Piers, they couldn't make sense of how to profit off the, the canoe club, and I was pretty much out of luck. I had these two 45 foot long canoes, I was young and crazy enough to do something like this, and I bump up against this guy who looks a little bit like um, Charlie Chapman and Steve Martin, and uh, I said, what's this? And he goes, this is a uh, public space. I go, oh, you the parks? He goes, no. And I was like, alright. Um, I have a canoe club. And he goes, great, you belong here. And he goes, and I go, I can't afford to pay you uh, uh, rent. Because that's fine. My only ask of you is to succeed. And it turns out that I'm not the first person that said that. <laughs> Ten years later, um, that entity welcomed uh, entrepreneurs like myself, welcomed uh, social folks, and sprung forth, Friends of Hudson River Park, certainly inspired Waterfront Alliance, spawned Portside, an hot and kayak company, New York Kite Polo, New York Outrigger, the new club I started, North River Historic Ship Society, Working Harbor Committee, made possible the longest un uninterrupted voyage on the seas with Schooner Ann, made possible um, Fireboat uh, John J. Harvey, and the Liberty World Challenge, which I helped organize. Now, I guess that the real thing to think about is that one entity spawned all this, and all these guys are doing all this amazing stuff, including this meeting right here. There's nothing like that that I know of in the history of New York that has done something like this. That's freaky. 100 jobs today, 100 jobs, provides infrastructure for the community for programming, it provides infrastructure for ferries, 
in tall ships, and it costs the taxpayer zero. It's pointing to there's a private public model here that we've got to figure out and get it right. Because something like this, if this was policy, if we open the doors to communities and say, if you can make something like this, that's a good thing. If you can open the doors to the community and make it easy for us to do our thing and serve the community, that's a good thing. So I want to say just on behalf of my, my co-panelists uh, co here, um, we're lucky to have entrepreneurs here in the meeting because I've known these guys for years. But the most important thing is that Pier 66 is not a, a one-off deal. It's not just simply the genius of John Previtt. It's just the right thing to do with our public spaces to open up to the community. And already we have entrepreneurs who have followed suit and been inspired by John. So I don't want to hug the mic anymore, but thank you very much. I'm never good at these clipper things. It's the right arrow. <laughs> the right one? Yeah. Hey. Hey, man, at this time. All right. So I'm Carlina Salguero, um, founder and president of Portside, New York. Thanks to um, Bob and the Cornell team for this amazing space, for the Waterfront Alliance for organizing it, uh, Roger for really um, triggering a lot of this discussion. So, Portside, New York, um, a living lab for better urban waterways. We have an interesting um, real estate story. So I think we're going to I'm going to present some of the difficulties and then um, present us as it's definitely been a learning example. So the goal that we are trying is this mic being bad. Just push is that better? Yeah. Is it working at all? Yeah. It's on. Okay, fine. Yeah, so, um, Portside is over 10 years old, and we are trying, still trying, to create this vision. So, the idea was that we wanted to be an example, inspired in part by Crevy, in large part by Crevy, but doing slightly differently, combining the working waterfront public access on community development. So, we did two business plans um, for two different sites in Red Oak. We don't have to be in Red Oak, but it just happened to be where we started. So, there would be B2B services to the maritime industry turning the working waterfront in, into an attraction. So I didn't have the term honeycombing, but to use Roger's term, the idea was these various activities, some of them might be considered commercial, some of them might be considered educational, would have a synergistic relationship, and they would mutually benefit each other. So some of the B2B services, for example, would generate revenue for us, which would help subsidize the cultural and educational activity. So a big one was a tugboat dock and shop at Fairway. And we did the market research for that, and that was going to be like thousands and thousands of dollars coming to us. And a lot of business to Fairway, which I'm going to point out is now facing bankruptcy. It's too bad they didn't want to set that up there. Um, the vessels coming and going become a maritime museum, a living museum of activity, which we then interpret. Um, pipeline to jobs. Red Hook has um, the largest public housing project in Brooklyn, the second largest in the city, with the usual statistics, incredibly high unemployment. And I know, as a water rat who's been hanging around the working waterfront um, since 1998, um, that there have often been a lot of jobs there, but there was no connection between the available jobs and the adjoining community. So there were going to be youth boat building programs and tanker camp and after school programs and things which would get kids into that industry. Um, and then that would be a pipeline to them in a marine career desk. We were not going to replace the academies like where Matt Paragon went, SUNY Maritime. But there would be a desk that would refer youth and adults to available jobs because there's such a disconnect between, in Portside's language, the community afloat and the community ashore. There's not this engagement. In any case, that's the goal. But then we, we had this story of all these challenges. And so what I want to say is our challenges are not just specific to us. So I, as a founder, I've certainly made a number of mistakes. So anyone considering a waterfront nonprofit, come talk to me later. I'll tell you what not to do. Um, <laughs> but really, the because I was a journalist before Portside, and I was reporting on the harbor before I decided to try and change and better the harbor by founding Portside, I have earned the confidence of many um, people in the maritime industry, of all sectors of the industry, of all scales, and have many colleagues in the nonprofit sector on the waterfront. So I can tell you what Portside has faced is shared by this diverse constituency. And it breaks down into two things. There's some design impediments and their management impediments. Um, and the management ones are really huge. Even if you have a viable peer, trying to use that peer really can be very difficult. So one of my colleagues, I'm on the New York Rising Committee, which is planning resiliency. Gita Nanda, when I told her only recently what the original intention of ports is, we're still trying to do it. She goes, like, wow, if you were in Europe, the government would have given you millions of dollars to do this. <laughs> I love that quote. I'm like, yeah, that'd be great, right? So now the next image is what a colleague who's a producer for a major radio uh, documentary show in, in Canada sent me as a note card. She said, I found something, Carlina, which describes your experience. 
<laughs> That's it. You know, and, uh, and I'm not the T-Rex. So, I mean, simply put, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of bureaucracy, um, and these are some of the tendencies. It's slow, culture of no, incredibly complex, not clear who's in charge, there's no reward for change, um, inaction seems to be an acceptable scenario, and so this altogether makes this incredible thicket of stuff that you're trying to get through. And, I mean, I could talk for hours with some specific examples, but I'm going to try not to, but I just needed to put this up there because unless you've dealt with it, it's really hard to understand how impenetrable this is. The terms that I've often used in describing Port Side Story are Kafka-esque, um, or negotiating with fog, because who's in charge just kind of keeps moving and rolling around. Um, so, the, the net result is the system is stacked against innovation, um, and also the little guy. So, with Roger's goal, which I would support, of somehow trying to get more innovative, more community connected sort of things, the problem is, certainly as a startup like Portside or a smaller player, only the big players can survive this degree of paperwork, the incredible delays. Because what happens is the time is the time on the clock of months and years elapsing in negotiations, which often don't resolve. Um, but it's also the staff time in doing that. We've spent more time at Boardside playing defensive ball and negotiating than actually raising money. Or And the problem is if you don't have a space, it's actually hard to raise that money. So we've actually never been presented the proper conditions to grow. So it's really been an incredible scramble. The other way I can tell you is we're an extraordinarily resilient organization. But you know, surviving is different than thriving. Um, and the bottom line, this has deterred many, many players from actually trying to do things. So I think we should fix the system so that on the waterfront we can live up to New York's um, reputation for innovation and creativity and dynamism and all of that. So moving ahead, how to maybe change this? What I'm going to suggest is first of expanding the definition of community. So um, I have found that that often is referred to as being like the residential community adjoining the waterfront site which from Portside's point of view is really too narrow, the waterfront and the waterways, and I want to make it clear, those are two separate things. The city's first wave of revitalization focused on the land edge to the water, not the waterways. Vision 2020, by the way, I love city planning. Jessica, the outside agency that I think is really great, and Vision 2020 I think is a rock star plan. Um, the, water, the waterfront and the waterways are a resource for everybody. So I think some of the planning really, there's almost there's too much weight that has been put to, let's see what the local community board says. So the local community boards in the past, for example, have been opposed to boats in Hudson River Park. I don't think that that's right, that they get to have that kind of influence over a resource that is actually citywide. So I'm not, I'm all for community, but I really actually want to expand that. I know this makes it more complex, but there we are. And the other thing in Port Side's language, there's a community of shore and the community of float. The afloat community is the maritime entities, all of them. Kayaks on up to tugboats and bigger. Um, and they're generally not at the table. Now, their own fault. They don't tend to speak up. They are, um, Venetia Lannan described it very well at a Waterfront Alliance conference as this silent industry. But they're the community that can only be at the waterfront on the waterways. And so their needs and what they have to offer should be particularly weighted. Um, equity. There's really not a good equity scene in New York. It's really not good. I mean, there's an incredible focus on Manhattan. Not only the investment, but also the advocacy. Incredible numbers of advocacy organizations that are, you know, presumably dealing with not hyper-local issues are really incredibly focused on Manhattan. So neighborhoods, whether people of color, low income, or industry and mixed use, particularly um, not getting investment or assistance from outside. They may be representing themselves, but it's getting connected to a larger group. The concept of economic justice is one that I advanced in 2005 at a city council hearing which was dedicated to what they called the regulatory obstacles to waterfront development, which was a long way to say the state DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. It was only about the DEC. And so there, in the early 2000s, I spoke to every um, property owner in Red Hook who owned waterfront property, um, and many of them cited a big problem for repairing their property was the difficulty of getting a DEC permit. There were many difficulties, but one in particular was they were told that when the pier was over 50% gone, they couldn't get it back. And I said, that's not fair. That's an economic injustice. Why should that neighborhood be penalized because it declined economically? Because if they're going to use that rule, that's only going to mean that wealthy communities get to keep infrastructure. And that's not right. Um, our metrics need to change. 
So I was one of many voices, boat-oriented voices in the early 2000s that tried to convince MWA to not use the term public access. Because public access just gets you to the edge. It doesn't deal with the fence. It doesn't deal with engagement with the water. Use of the water, we were saying, no, 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 don't use that term. You, you won't see that term on Portside's website. We don't push for public access. We're pushing for public use. Um, also, I would say, I'm an artist, a photographer, a watering photographer, but I think the focus on design um, has maybe blinded us to activation. It's like use. So we have a lot of parks that are gorgeously designed, but so designed to the smallest detail that the spaces actually can't be flexibly used. It's all pre-thought out. And some of the designs, for example, the, the fences are gorgeous, but getting increasingly complex and hard to remove. I mean, I'm one of many people who vote people who thinks there should be standard sectional removal fences so that you can take them out to have boats come in and out. Um, community development, not just revenue, um, should be a metric. So particularly, for example, the EDC has said in a number of public meetings about DOC NYC and other ones in Brooklyn that traditionally revenue was their metric for success. At the Sunset Park Task Force a few months ago, they said we're now adding job count. Um, that's not even triple bottom line. That doesn't have indirect economic benefits. So I think that we should argue, I'm using different language from Roger, but essentially agreeing with Roger, another way to determine success. And then agreeing with Roger at the bottom, organic small growth, not just the pre-planned mega project, and incubation. Your know, Portside has not been incubated, we've been clobbered. Um, and then this gets more complicated. I don't have an answer here, because I'm not someone who invents bureaucracies. But you know, how to make the bureaucracy accountable? And I don't think there's any evil empire here. I mean, many people who I deal with um, in these various agencies and departments are wonderful people, but there's something systemic that happens. Um, and there's some challenges, I think, just the way it's structured. So in the middle of things I'd like to have, they should listen to input and there should be more transparency and certainly fulfilling promises. Portside is a promise denied. We were promised a home for multiple years and it wasn't delivered. But it's a challenge to how do we get there because the waterways themselves don't have a political district. And the waterfront, the land edge, is chopped up through multiple um, electoral districts and community boards. So consequently, it's hard to advocate for citywide principles because our political system isn't structured for that. Also, many of the major waterfront parks are run by these independent authorities. And so oversight for them is pretty challenging. I mean, there are an incredible number of lawsuits against Brooklyn Bridge Park. You know, so there's um, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Governor's Island, um, Hudson River Park, Valley Park City. These are enormous places and they're run by entities, their budgets aren't controlled by the city council. And so how do you how do you influence that? One and then what are the standards, you know, what are going to be the standards for success? So I don't I honestly don't know how we get to the solution. Is it the Department of the Waterfront? Is there making a political district for the port site is called the blue space or is called the sixth borough um, in Vision 2020. But the current system actually is not working, I think, to really address citywide issues. Um, I also think, you know, we advocates could get better at this. Um, there's been a tendency, the top line is to sort of kvetch within the group. I don't know how many kvetching sessions I've been to over beer. It's like, go talk to somebody else about it. You know, talk to the media, get your elected officials involved, kind of complaining to the in-group. I mean, honestly, I think, I mean, are there any members of the media here? Ah, oh, bummer. You know, I think one of the largest, you know, associations on the waterfront is what I call the Commiseration Society. And that's all the people who get together and we all agree that it's not well run, it's really miserable. You know, so there's a consensus out there, but you gotta tell someone who doesn't already know and believe that that there's a problem and then come up with a solution. Um, my request to the Waterfront Alliance would be some method for us to vote on, on policy choices, because you know, we as operators would love to have your policy reflect what we're working for and You've created an organization which is highly visible, sought out, and, and has a capacity, and so that would be great. Um, the media, speaking as a recovering journalist, they could do a much better job, and I tell them that. Um, and I think, frankly, one of the biggest stories is what's not happening on the waterfront. So the stories are always like, there's a new pier. I'm like, okay, maybe the pier was designed for maritime uses, or it was intended for maritime uses, let me correct that, but it's actually not well designed for maritime uses. But I've never seen that story in print. But the Commiseration Society is very clear about that. We all know we're always talking like, did you, did you see the size of those fenders? Oh my god, you know, there's no place to, you know, bring a vehicle into load. Incre there's no electricity, there's no water. I mean, all the, we have the list, we all know. But that's not in the press. And I think part of it is that I know waterfront beat reporters. Um, because the problem is, 
A lot of this is like landlord-tenant issues. You don't want to start complaining about your landlord because you could get in trouble. So how do you get the story out? Now, a waterfront beat reporter knows how to find these things. They understand things, and they can get be beyond the press release. And a lot of our media now is press release driven. Um, so for example, I don't know, every time there's some new park pier, it's always like the architecture, no offense, Bob, but you know, there's like, it's like the architecture, you know, design reviewer comes in and there's like never on a maritime pier, there's no one who looks at it operationally who discusses those things like are there cleats, fenders, is the freeboard height appropriate, um, is there, you know, the appropriate kind of shade, are boats able to use this on the maritime pier, that's never discussed. And so I'm all for beautiful things. I am deeply for beautiful things, but I am deeply for beautiful things that are functional there. And so again, my point is you got to talk outside the in-group to help, you know, get that word out. So, you know, um, I'm an optimist. I think we can do it. I think we've got to try and do it. And those are my suggestions. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan ping He from Two Bridges Neighborhood Council. Uh, thank you, Waterfront Alliance and Cornell for hosting this. I've been a repeat deep diver for the past few weeks, so um, I'm excited to be on the other side. So I will be <laughs> focusing on equitable waterfront development, specifically along the Lower Manhattan East River waterfront. Um, a little bit about Two Bridges. We are a 60-year-old organization. We were founded in 1955, and this was a time when the Lower East Side was seeing an influx of immigrants becoming much more racially and ethnically diverse, and unfortunately that led to conflicts and, and tensions. And so Two Bridges was founded really to bring together residents, uh, church leaders, educators, uh, to find solutions to smooth over, over these tensions, create stronger community bonds, and also provide per positive cultural change. Um, in the 70s, we took the opportunity to partner with Settlement Housing Fund to sponsor the Two Bridges Urban Renewal Area. Uh, so you've seen that map where it's pink. Uh, that is the, the, the lot that we redeveloped. There were previously dilapidated tenements, you know, tuberculosis and uh, asthma, and they were demolished and together with Settlement Housing Fund, we built higher quality high-rise uh, affordable units. So over those 20 years, we created about a thousand affordable housing units. Uh, we still own about two buildings, totaling around 30, 300 units. And so as you can see from the map that all the buildings we built are right by the waterfront. And so today, you know, as even though we don't build buildings anymore right now, um, we still think to ourselves, you know, we built these buildings, we've brought a thousand families to the waterfront. What is our responsibility in ensuring that the neighborhood is livable, but also a quality choice for the many low and moderate income families we've brought there? Um, so with that in mind, you know, we've always had this, I, this belief that the waterfront and the surrounding uplands are all connected. Uh, these are photos not even from Hurricane Sandy, but from Hurricane Irene a year earlier. Mm -hmm. And even then, we've seen that there is a major crisis <laughs> about to come. And unfortunately, that happened. Um, but you know, this is a literal, a literal reminder that, again, the, the edge between the water and the hardscape is not concrete. It's not definite. There definitely is blending. And that Beyond that, you know, the waterfront is not divided by community board districts or not divided by uh, the city agencies and its jurisdictions and definitely not by the, prop the different property owners and lots. Um, it's all one piece. It's all, um, it has to be considered together. And when this happens, it, it just happens. Um, it doesn't care who owns what. Um, but, you know, we show these pictures to remind people of the vulnerability and threats of the neighborhood. Um, but it's not necessarily a fair depiction either, um, because with all that looming on, over the horizon, there actually is a lot of joy, positivity. Our residents very much enjoy accessing the waterfront. Um, you can see that it's used for passive and active recreation. Uh, people socialize, and they just go there as a place to find peace and uh, quiet. Sorry, quiet. Um, so keeping this all in mind, um, since the 90s, Two Bridges has advocated that there needs to be some sort of master planning process that considers the waterfront and community development alongside 
as one total process and that again it can't be just parsed out in different pieces or uh, d different um, like different individual responsibilities are for one person not the other it has to be all together and so for the past four years we've been leading um, a stakeholder coalition called the South Street Initiative and we had to do a lot of research in the past four years to come up with a vision and mission statement. And what you're seeing here is pretty much a graphic amalgamation of all the plans that have been created for the Lower Manhattan waterfront. And you know, it's it makes for a very pretty rainbow. <laughs> it's clearly very dense. Um, but the sad truth is that uh, the number of plans that have been fully actualized is zero. And so. Or as there have been hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars spent in creating these plans, um, unfortunately, not much has come of it. And so, even then, you know, you may think this is understandable. Like good ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, it's just the more ideas, the better. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, and we compare the Two Bridges neighborhood to other waterfront neighborhoods, uh, we see a very stark contrast, not just in the community and demographics, but the state of the public areas, as well as the, you know, the types of uses that residents and neighbors get to enjoy. So we compared Lower East Side to uh, the West Side and Dumbo, and vast differences in <laughs> income uh, and the poverty rates, and also, as you can see, um, so that photo in the middle is what the waterfront looks like for one of the largest housing public housing complexes in the Lower East Side, and that's Upper East Smith Houses. And not an exaggeration, their view of the river is a staging area for pretty much most of their waterfront. So we we find that to be like alarming, very alarming and unfair and inequitable. Um, so who currently manages and stewards a waterfront in the Lower Manhattan? It is the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, since 2006, 2007, they've been tasked with redeveloping the entire East River waterfront for the East River Esplanade. And so, you know, some of the examples that we have in our neighborhood that the positive changes they brought to the neighborhood is this playground area uh, where it's uh, very accessible, uh, intuitive active equipment active exercise equipment and you can see that it's very it was very much welcome people use it all the time they love it um, it's definitely a great asset and for that we thank EDC and then 50 feet and a staging area away we have this and this is a this was constructed as a bocce court for the neighborhood as you can see this is it's completely underutilized no one actually plays bocce within it um, and you can see there's nice seating available uh, it's still a great open space except what has ended up happening is that this is a perfect playground for skateboarders to come we actually have skateboarders coming from all over the city uh, to practice their stunts and tricks which is great they're part of the community unfortunately they oftentimes terrorize the children and senior citizens hoping to enjoy a seat and so in this sense, you know, we bring these two examples to really show that in some ways EDC can bring great change and great projects in the neighborhood. And in other instances, there's just a bit of a gap in kind of their understanding of the local community and what is suit suitable for them. Um, and so thinking to the bigger picture again, here are some articles and pieces about um, EDC's presence or lack of in the, in the area. Um, you know, one of the things that we advocate for is that the rental income generated by um, the waterfront should go back to the local community. Right now, the money just goes into one EDC pot, and you know, the way to first is citywide. But is there a way that the money generated can serve the immediate <laughs> neighborhood? And so, there was quite a bit of outrage about uh, the leasing of the Battery Maritime Building for pretty much free. Um, as well as consistent frustrations that can people still see me? <laughs> consistent frustrations that the projects are consistently delayed. Uh, residents and communities are hoping for new amenities, but they're years behind. And so, another aside, I was actually at a community board meeting 
uh, where EDC had to explain that the, the period 35 would, would be delayed again. And one of the members actually referenced a bocce court, and her joke was, well, by the time we finished it, all the Italians left the Lord beside. <laughs> and it just... <coughs> okay. Um, so one more thing, uh, another story. They had released a request for expressions of interest to operate a pavilion to be constructed. Uh, two bridges actually proposed a, um, sent in a proposal where we would operate community space with Hamilton Madison House and other service providers in the area as well as inviting Vizelka to have a commercial outpost by the waterfront. So currently there are no, there is no commercial activity where we are. Uh, it's very hard to find food and drink if you're enjoying the waterfront and um, it makes a deterrent for people to, people to go. And then EDC, said that, EDC actually said this year that they did not receive a proposal which we were very disappointed by. Um, but moving forward from that, we <laughs> uh, four years after the South Street Initiative was formed, and we could meet over 40 stakeholders, ranging from resident leaders, business owners, property owners, um, advocacy groups, and um, one more. I'll get back to you on that. But it was a very wide range of stakeholders, and from their research, we decided that we discerned that the best way to address this to encourage and facilitate equitable waterfront development would be to have an alternative stewardship model. And so this year we incorporated with other members of the coalition, um, the South Street East River Community Development Corporation. And so um, again, the it's, it's a much more diverse stakeholder coalition. We have the air of not just waterfront groups, but economic development groups. And what the vision is, is that in many ways, community members are often asked to come out to workshops, they're often asked to come to public forums to give insight and suggestions, and then you're repeatedly disappointed by the lack of implementation. And so in some sense, you know, what is the actual leverage or um, influence it, they can have in these planning projects and implementation, implementations. So we see that CDC is a way to institutionalize community engagement, really not have a group ready to mobilize, ready to provide feedback, um, but also really give genuine community engagement. Um, something that we've you know, thought more and more is that for all these projects, consultants are repeatedly compensated to do community engagement while residents and neighbors are you know, they don't receive anything. Um, and so what do community members want? They want to be engaged, they want to give their input, but they want to see results, and they want to make sure that it's being done right. Um, and so we also have a very um, strong mission for economic development. We see that the waterfront could provide a lot of jobs. Um, so the example, I guess, to my right is the Brooklyn Bridge Beach, which was actually part of the East River Blue Way plan. And, you know, people really, really wanted to have a beach in the lower Manhattan, you could have kayaking and other actual waterfront use. And despite having secured $7 million in city, in city funding, this year uh, EDC has announced that they do not find it a suitable site for a beach and that it would not be possible, which unfortunately makes community members, again, very disappointed and frustrated. Um, and also having commercial activity. Right now there's no commercial zoning where we are. And we really see that uh, for an area that has a 30% unemployment rate, that is a huge need that should be filled. And so because we can't have, say, storefronts, we could, we could have temporary activations like street markets. Um, we've seen it at Hester Street Fair that businesses can be incubated along the waterfront. They can uh, start off as stalls and then have their own brick and mortar stores. And that it would really benefit the two bridges and the overall waterfront community that it could bridge across the community boards and also bridge across uh, the different uses of the waterfront and opportunities that it could bring. Um, so thank you.
hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Yes? Okay. So, I didn't prepare any kind of real presentation. Um, <laughs> I come at this from a very different angle. I literally took that picture yesterday. Um, and that, uh, the tug and the barge and this. So, I come uh, from two different angles. Uh, as mentioned, my original company is called Lehigh Maritime. And I started that about, about nine years ago. Um, I purchased the, the uh, ever infamous Tug Cornell, who was known by the, you know, the old boating community, and uh, it grew from there. Um, just trying to think how how to wrap it all around. But my other involvement is with the barge bar, right? and that is exactly what it is. We decided to build a waterfront center. It's not just a bar. Things are changing a little bit this year uh, on a porch, and directly inspired by, as mentioned previously before, John Krebby. Uh, we all were friends and worked with and, and saw his inspiration for what he did for the working waterfront, and we wanted to take that model and expand on it, maybe even dial it back a little bit and, and focus more on waterfront uh, access, and I say that in by connecting people with the water. So that's, that's the term I use, is to connect people with the water. Get from one to the other, wherever you're coming from. So I come from the other side. I'm on the boat and I'm trying to get here, okay? And that's some of the challenges that I face. Uh, the running joke we used to make years ago was, there's no place to tie up in New York City, so we'll just make one. Okay. <laughs> and we did. Uh, not without a tremendous amount of, uh, <laughs> I don't know what this, uh, challenges. <laughs> it's a nice way to put it, um, both from private and uh, governmental agencies. Um, not, not well, one in particular, but there were several involved. <laughs> <laughs> um, the city actually wasn't bad at all, I have to say. Um, but our goal here, and the goal for day one since I formed my little company with the Cornell was to connect people with the water and we do that in several ways. Uh, with the tug we do uh, professional training and education. We can't do that in New York City because there's nowhere to do it. There's nowhere to tie up. There's no place to work out of. Uh, we do it on the Hudson River. We've been doing it primarily out of Kingston. Uh, now we do it out of a little town called Verplank which is just uh, north of Croton if you're familiar with that. And we'll go back and forth literally 8 o'clock this morning, I was on that boat on our way back to Verplank and made my way back down here for this meeting. Um, and I will be back at that barge tomorrow, continuing to get us open for this year. But the to get to this point was just the... I, we built all this. We, we, we created it all and we, we from scratch. This little barge was nothing but a simple little deck barge. Uh, Jose, are there any more pictures or is it just this one? Four. Just four? Okay. I just literally emailed them the pictures. So, <laughs> well, it's kind of the same thing. Um, that was us leaving last year. Um, kind of an interesting perspective is that you probably can't tell from the light of this, and this does speak to some of the issues with the shoreline, is that this tugboat currently is sitting two feet out of the water than it normally should be. And that's because the pier lines and all the old piers and shorelines have become so silted in and inaccessible that there's only about a two to three hour window twice a day that I could actually get in and out of there. Otherwise, that boat just sits on the bottom. Mm. So she's actually about two feet taller than she should be. You can see how much higher it is than the barge. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the problems we face. There's nowhere to really go. Mm. Um, story from another friend of mine was, but relates to this and why we are creating this waterfront center was uh, during 9 11 with the fireboat, John J. Harvey had to pull up and put lines around trees at the battery so that they could pump water to the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. Not 30 seconds after a friend of mine goes and wraps a line around a tree, does a park officer come <laughs> over and says, you can't do that. <laughs> and said, go find a cop. But it's kind of a sad, but reality of that our waterfront infrastructure is just not there. It's gone. It's dilapidated. It's beyond 50%. You can't bring it back. There used to be a pier right here. There used to be a 600 foot pier shed that extended out. Oh, oh. Okay, that's kind of looking back at the building. This used to be a pier shed. And you can kind of see where it transitioned and they kind of covered it over. And uh, what you're seeing here now is obviously from the barge on land. And what we're trying to create is a waterfront hub. 
And yes, we have a bar, we have restaurants, we have kayaking, we have sailing programs. We will have the ability to where you saw the tug before is being dedicated on the north side for historic ships, educational vessels, visiting vessels of such to be able to come and go and access the Brooklyn waterfront. On the south side, which is still pseudo in construction, but you can see it, uh, and literally built just a few days ago, uh, we have a floating dock and that's where we'll be running the smaller vessel operations, uh, kayaking, sailing access. Uh, we're partnered up with several entities out of Manhattan right now because there are none here. So we're trying to bring this, we're trying to basically bring you know, a Kirby-esque community to Brooklyn. And the community has been very excited about it. Not the community board, but the community. Um, we had our community board meeting last night. I wasn't there for it. Um, for the uh, renewal for some of our permits. It went okay, it went a lot better than last year, but we're here. So one thing I will say is regardless of all of the challenges we faced with, and mainly with uh, the DEC, uh, which has been mentioned before, and the environmental issues they were fearing that we might create, uh, we're still here, we got through it, we worked with them, we definitely challenged them. That, that I think the, the, the quote was, uh, pioneering new territory. And, but we did it. Um, let me see if um, that last picture is. Okay, well, there you go. So, uh, in the, <coughs> so, we attempted to open May of last year. This picture was taken in October when we opened. Because we opened in you know, just a few days, yeah, I think it was September 26th or 27th. And we had to close uh, by November 1st because that's what our DEC permit said. Even though we had a wonderful summer last year, a wonderful fall, nice and warm. Uh, but nevertheless, people came out and, uh, and we're excited. Uh, we weren't able to get all of our waterfront programs up and running because by the time we were open, none of the partners could, could really work with us. But this year we're gonna come out strong and get people connected with the water. Uh, I don't know much more really go into that. We, but, and another thing is to, to state and, and a lot of people know that we there was three of us and we did this not without a tremendous amount of help and support from our friends and family and, and waterfront alliance but there's just three of us that did this with our own funds and i have a 65 year old tugboat that needs a lot of work you know but we you know it, it, we're self-supporting in that we're out there we did all the construction we did all the work uh, we friends and family were down there cleaning and, and, and and just helping us put this together because they realize that this is such a really good thing. And uh, you know, we don't have any uh, investors and things like that. There's just three of us that have literally thrown it all out there and we're, and we're just happy to be back this year because we actually survived. But uh, not by much. But uh, you know, it's because it's something we really believe in. We believe it's important, uh, not just for Brooklyn. We did it in Brooklyn because this was where we could do it. And we have come to really uh, get to know the community in Greenpoint and Williamsburg, and we're hoping to draw people from everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter, Manhattan, Lower Brooklyn, Queens, you know, Long Island City. Um, if we can do this again somewhere else, else in the city, great. Create the same idea, you know. Um, but there were a lot of hurdles, but we're, we're still here. Um, that's about it for me. I, I, I don't think I have any more. Nope, sorry. And now we're looking at um, what does waterfront stewardship mean to you in our word cloud here? What are we seeing here? Connections, community empowerment, clean water. Okay. Interesting. Clean up days, activation, active, citizen science, connections, a way to pay repairs. What else are we saying? Um, rooted, belonging, live, lively, urban, care. Interesting, okay. Keep structures safe. 
Maritime Uplift <coughs> Responsive Connections. Fun. Oh, that's a good one. Fun. Okay. It's fun. Um, great. So we're we're using our waterfront. We're recreating on it. We want to, it's um, about keeping it clean. About bringing community. About connections. Yeah. Let's see what our next question was. What social connections do the waterfront create? <coughs> Too many. <laughs> I'm sure there's more out there, guys. Sharing history, connecting communities via ferries, opportunities to enjoy the church together by escaping the <laughs> Kissing, yep, we've all done that. <laughs> so it's a place, greater connection to the world, space for building connections. So we're hearing, we're hearing this word community, I feel like, over and over again. And um, I think in everyone's presentation, you use the word community. So um, I think maybe a good place for us to start is just unpacking that word a little bit. And um, I'm curious to open, I'd like to open up that, that word to the panelists and um, what, what community means to each one of you. Um, we're so reliant on that word, we throw it out all the time, but um, I think it means lots of different things. So, um, does anyone want to kick us off by, by tackling that question and that issue? I thought I already did, so I would just be repeating myself. Well, it, for me, I guess I am thinking uh, a community as um, next to the areas that we would designate as uh, waterfront stewardship zones. Oh, shame. I know. I'm sorry, uh, but of course, but of course, the role of all the activators in there either come from the community itself or also uh, come from folks with skills outside the community. Uh, I don't see any reason why we have to militate that. Um, but I, I certainly feel like the community has to be a part of the brainstorming on an ongoing basis uh, to decide uh, the relationship with the activities on the waterfront and what's going on in the Upland institutions. And it, it just can't be one meeting and talk about a plan it's got to be an ongoing conversation saying, we got to get a program from our school going here. We need a, a yoga class for our well-being clinics. And we much deeper creativity between community and activities on the waterfront. So I just feel like that that mechanism, whether it's community boards, which I don't think it is, has to be somehow developed. That's my idea. I think there was also a concept of sort of tourism in the proposal as well. And um, I think in Ping too, there was also a sort of a little bit of an element of tourism um, and obviously, both Carolina and Matt, your your um, projects rely on people coming to the to the barges and boats. And um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the role of tourism and and how that intersects with also these other ideas of community that we're talking about. Um, <laughs> well, in Portside's case, there's there's this the, the theory and the goal and what we've been limited to. Um, so since we've not been able to get the real estate to make this place called Portside, New York, we don't actually have the robust thing that I'd like to have. But what's in our DNA, essentially, is community development and community revitalization associated with the activity on the waterfront. So that means um, having visitors coming, in our case by land and by sea, was the intention, or is the intention, um, and that's going to benefit local people. So it will be providing jobs for some local people at our site, on those vessels, um, the passengers sloshing to and fro through the neighborhood, then are depositing money um, in retail establishments. Um, so that's an essential part of it. And I would say, for example, right now, like comparing the port side idea of um, we are promised space in Atlantic Basin by the EDC. Um, we have a berth for the Mary Whale, but we don't actually have the dock master functions or the interior space that were part of the original promise. The current leasing that the EDC does via Dock NYC really has negligible effect on Reddit because none of those boats are actually picking up or dropping up passengers there. There, um, there. there was no thought given to how the maritime activity is going to connect inland. So the EDC leased um, land real estate first, warehousing, parking lots. The last thing they got to was the waterfront leasing. Um, they tried, you know, they ran us around for quite a long time. They ran Vane Brothers around for quite a long time on their Warfridge RFP, didn't provide the space to Portside or to Vane. Then they came up with Dock NYC. So I'm happy to see the Pier 4 right now, and it's an interesting maritime pier. There's an incredible array of vessels, but it, it has no connection to Reddick at all, no indirect economic benefits, except for some cups of coffee by the crew that they buy. 
just to also add to the question of, you know, what do you mean by community? Um, so for the South Street Initiative and the South Street East River CDC, you know, a really big way we want to think about this is, you know, who are the stakeholders along the waterfront? Um, who stands to most to lose if there were a disaster to hit again, but also who can really benefit from positive change and um, like economic development? And for us, you know, that means a very wide range of stakeholders. And, you know, I think in the past, traditionally, we think of the loudest ones being the ones with the most money or the ones with property. But as we see now that uh, public housing residents, you know, uh, schools, just your everyday person is a very valuable stakeholder. And to tie back to the theme of today's panel discussion, social capital, right? Like social capital is how does who you know help you achieve a goal, right? And for all of us, luckily, we have very community-driven goals, uh, stakeholder goals. Um, but we're finding that more and more residents and neighbors and employees are really valuable for guiding plans uh, appropriately and effectively. And so, again, this idea of community is like, how can we draw the strengths of stakeholders, but also their knowledges, their skill sets, and to achieve, again, a better waterfront that we can access and use. And tourism is also benefits stakeholders, <laughs> so it's great too. Is this one? Yeah, okay. Um, well, we're kind of, for the community stuff, um, it, it's, for us it's almost uh, circular, so um, by creating this kind of community waterfront on our end, and that's what we are kind of calling community waterfront center, if you will, kind of a not, you know, unofficial uh, term. Uh, we're, we're hooking up with local businesses to help support us, uh, drive jobs for them, and in turn bring in like, the educational boats and different programs that have no access to these sites now. Uh, different vessels that operate in the harbor that just simply can't get into these areas. And taking it around again, those vessels as Carolina has been trying to do, need a support mechanism. They need places to get water. They need places to get food. They need to get their crew on and off. Yeah. So, and they're going to turn around and they're going to go right to the local communities for those, for that support. So, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, other community activities too that I didn't talk about. We are. I saw fishing pop up there, which was actually kind of low. We are actually connecting up with the DEC. Uh, kind of going the other way with their fishing program. Uh, we're connecting it up with uh, Harbor School through their Billion Oyster Project to help cultivate the, uh, the relaying of the oyster beds. And we're going to be looking to local community for support of those programs. And it, it goes both ways. It, you know, it's kind of a back and forth scenario. Um, yeah, that's kind of does community and business. Yeah. So, so one thing I'm hearing and what struck me about all of your presentation is um, just how much it seems uh, the, the role of the very uh, sort of the enlightened, um, die-hard uh, waterfront activists like the folks here, how important that person is in, in terms of making these places, whether it's the Don Crevy or any of you, and really curating and bringing that together. And so. I guess one, one question I have for the group is, you know, how, how, how do we scale up? How do we make things replicable? And I think that's what Roger's trying to get at with, with his idea of waterfront. Stewardship zones is, you know, how can we not rely just on sort of the genius of one person, but really scale it and, and, and be able to replicate these things? And it's a real challenge because so much really does rely on sort of the, that, um, that grit that um, seems to go into this. But, but, Let's throw out some ideas about how we can, can sort of scale up these ideas. Well, well, something tells me if the right RFP goes out, and every time EDC shoot, shoots one out, I always read it because I'm always excited about it, you know? Um, if the right RFP goes out, I think the right uh, respondent will come along. We'll be able to riff on these things. I mean, it's kind of straightforward stuff. When you have, for example, something like Matt's or, or John Krebby's space, when you have a barge like that, you now have the opportunity to actually have ferries. You have infusions of human beings coming in. You have canoe and kayak clubs. You have infusions of human beings. Now you can support the minimal a cafe very quickly. 
if you put a little farmer's market in there and a few other really tempting things, then you have a super infusion of community saying, this is a really cool thing. It's kind of funky and it's interesting. And it's all community stuff. It's not, you know, brand name stuff. And just a, an aside, Matt and I did something in 2013 called Hudson Rising, paid for by the state. And uh, basically, we brought around 12,000 people to the, to the waterfronts of the upper cities upstate. And we uh, used all Matt's equipment. And inside an old 1940 covered barge, we had a woman selling her uh, latest jam concoction. We had another woman displaying her vertical farming um, apparatus. And we had historians talking about their cities. We had DEC saying how the river made that's this city great. And this place was packed. And you know it was all done on a shoestring, and it was just people were getting this this thing that was going on was the organic assets in place. And finally, MPS, uh, National Park Service, came on board, and they're like, "We have organic assets. We have heritage stories." I go, "Darn right, you do. Show up and tell your story. This is a beautiful thing. That's why people are here." And it was kind of a um, talk about touristic power, the authenticity that drives both local folks and people from afar. I wanted to say that. Yeah. And we literally created the space to do it. Created the space to do There were no dock infrastructure, there was nothing. There was zero accessibility to several different towns. And we just decided, and by bringing that, people came yeah, and in droves. And the, and the moral of that story really was the fun of going to different cities and yeah. seeing how city government reacted to the whole thing. In oh, some yeah. cases, they just didn't get it. And <laughs> Kingston, no less didn't get it. Um, right. Osning, out of control, got it. And they were just like, this is beautiful, we're going to give you everything. Beacon. Yeah, Beacon got it. And what happened was when the when the cities met us halfway and put a little bit of shoulder into it, everyone started glowing with this, wow, this is a celebration of the organic assets in place. It was exciting to be a part of, not a, tr a, a trial to try and make it happen. No, it wasn't a trial. Yeah, for the city. That's how it is in the city. It's yeah. Every, every answer is no immediately. And we to fight to change that. Whereas these people were so behind the scenes. Yes. So I want to address the question. The way you phrased it, it sounded like, you know, it takes extraordinary individuals to do this, and that's the problem. So if it were not so extraordinarily difficult, more people would do it. And so what's happening in New York right now is you have to be really crazy to try and do this stuff. Um, and, and it shouldn't be that hard. Um, I actually would say, since Roger mentioned EDC RFPs, the, um, I, and I said this to the EDC in a conference call, um, because I, for being on the Sunset Park Task Force, that was established thanks to Councilman Carlos Menchaca. Its first project was to advise the EDC for the RFP they were creating. There's a lot of letters for SBMT, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. But then the work goes on to um, help influence the EDC's uh, the planning of a lot of waterfront property. In any case, I told them, having responded as portside to several EDC RFPs, they tend to write RFPs with too many demands and too many restrictions. And that makes it really hard to respond, as opposed to saying, we have a site, like give us some uses. And it just, I mean, I know lots of other operators that have tried to respond to these RFPs. It's really very difficult. And the EDC, frankly, on the waterfront, I say, has an, an extraordinary track record of RFPs that don't net a result. I mean, they get responses, or sometimes they don't get responses, they don't make a decision. So that's also driven lots of people away. And I know a number of them, they just won't do it anymore because. You know, you go through the process, it's a lot of work to respond to these things, and then there might be negotiations and follow up afterwards, and then the contract isn't awarded, and the pier sits empty, or the waterfront site sits empty. So I really think the RFP thing has got to be, to use New England modifier, wickedly different. It has to be really different. It has to be much simpler, more open, meaning less prescribed, and then it wouldn't be so hard to do this stuff. Um, so, so the question on the screen right now, I think, uh, gets at a lot of what we've been talking about, which is how can governments encourage waterfront placemaking both ashore and afloat? And so um, reduce permitting hurdles, reduce restrictions, um, stop saying no so much. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, <coughs> RFP competitions for design <coughs> research, rewriting the state's regulations, um, uh, policies that support and don't hinder these activities, less bureaucracy. So I, you know, I think we're hearing from the audience a lot of the same things that we're, we're hearing on the stage as well. The other thing I would think is, is just also a faster process, action, and frankly accountability. I mean, the Brooklyn Shore in particular is littered with EDC promises. And so there are many promises made, and some of them are promises that are called metric, like this, will, this facility will do X. 
and it doesn't. Or than the promises like the one made to Portside. But it wasn't just made to us. Portside is a, was a community give back to various communities, Maritime, Red Hook, CB6, um, uh, in exchange for the master lease going to Phoenix Beverage. And we never did get the spot. And the, the terms that we had to work under for the interim permits were not sustainable for us. There was never any opportunity to like write grants, you know, for interim program and a long-term program institutional growth because we were never given an LOI or any guarantee of anything. You know, port sites never used a permit that we have got. Uh, we've never had more than three weeks notice. Though we've op we've negotiated for over seven months. You know, and so that's a ratio that doesn't work. I mean, you, you can't spend seven months negotiating for a summer permit and get it on June twentieth. You know, that's the kind of mill that we've been in. I just want to say, I, th I think that's reflected like with urban farming, as I said. I think a lot of community members, meaning well, really got an enormous struggle ahead of them to do right. And it took a while. Now now government's behind it, and it's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think waterfront is the next thing. When you really do put the pieces together, how much uh, an, an entrepreneurial site like John Crevy's site and what Matt's doing can do for the community, uh, I, I hope that there will be uh, government recognition to support that as an official designation. Um, so we're actually almost out of time here, so I know this has sort of flown by, but um, I do want to open it up to the audience for questions. And so we have a few that I think people have written in. Um, let's see. Um, almost, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Where do we start? Um, I don't know, does anyone on the on the panel see something that jumps out at them that they want to tackle? I'm curious at upper left what, what they do. I want to know who asked uh, upper left. The, that the, was uh, me. I was figuring it was you actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I work on the water every day, creating public programs, but the list of activities is the first question, uh, or in the first question, don't apply it up to anything I do. Okay, to explain a little more. We do programs in maritime history and maritime skills. Um, the only thing that came close was environmental education because we partner with the River Project. I, I work on the lilac in Hudson River Park. Um, and uh, we do arts and cultural program. We have concerts on board, um, art exhibits, with, with all, always some kind of connection to the waterfront or maritime. But none of those things in list sailing, fishing, um, you know, swimming, none of those things are things that we do. So, so I was... Um, Feeling left out, even though I work on the water every day. <laughs> Actually, can, can we speak? Yeah. So the left column, second from the top, waterfront infrastructure expensive. How will funds be raised to create the zones? I want to actually not answer the question necessarily, but I want to say something. One of the things that actually also makes it difficult for the certainly the nonprofit users is there's often this expectation that we pay. Huh. You know that, and so either pay directly, like pay a fee to be there, or pay indirectly, as in the case of the Lilac, where the park, uh, Hudson River Park, decided that they would not finish the infrastructure in the pier. That each vessel that would win the RFP would have the exquisite pleasure of, you know, putting in, uh, you know, water connections or whatever. And the craziest thing, I, I will say, a word that I've often used in my portrait experience is Kafka-esque. The Hudson River Park said that. The gangways for the home ported vessels could not go on the pier. Now you look up the definition of a gangway, and it's typically something that goes from the boat to the pier. But they, I think, had designed the whole pier before they got to gangways, and somebody probably said there wasn't any room. So the vessels there had to come up and build themselves infrastructure that would hold the gangway. In the case of the lilac, if the lilac goes away, there's now what I call the carbuncle hanging out there, which would impede another visiting vessel coming in. It's that kind of crazy thing. It's an $18,000 carbuncle. Yeah, with a lot of added attached to it. So I mean, I think actually in this notion of indirect benefits, if you talk to particularly the tall ship community that goes up and down the eastern seaboard, they get paid to show up in other cities. They are embraced in other cities. Here, they can't find a room at the inn. It's too complicated. They need to get water. Yeah, well, that's well, that's the least of it, Jonathan. Forget that. I'm sorry. That's an irrelevancy. I mean, I don't, but. You know, and we don't have it here because there's this notion also of charging directly for this kind of thing. So if you know, not only do you get charged with agita, they actually often want you to pay. And and I I think there's there's something really wrong with that framework. I think I, think I can respond to that question too. Um, 
I think in certain situations it's a good investment, and I think there will be developers who, who kind of get it. At least I've been speaking with developers who love the idea of seeing, for example, a wildlife sanctuary that's a community stewardship space associated with their development. They, they like seeing human activity and the idea of getting going outside and seeing a fish market and potentially green market and kip hiking opportunities. That's good stuff. So there's, there's that. And I also think situations like Matt and John Krebby, there's a certain um, degree of creativity entrepreneurs bring in in terms of partnerships to get these things to move. So uh, it's possible to do it on limited terms, as John Krebby did and, and Matt's doing, and get enormous scale. And I think in certain situations, there'll be very little investment. But I think there's a full range of possibilities. Oh, lastly, state. I mean, couldn't you make the case of all the times the state has given the city money and their, and their idea that the, the, the money is going towards access? Couldn't you just show that maybe that access is pretty anemic? Huh. I mean, I mean, I, I think they really sat down and saw how many millions went yeah. to, to New York City and what the return was on access. Hundreds of millions. Yes. And I think the state would be happy, really happy, to know that there's a really strongly aligned system that the outcome is access in the most truest terms, in terms of use, as Judge Carlin has been saying. Um, I'm going to pick another question, uh, the bottom the bottom question right here in the green. How can we connect stewardship efforts of long-term resiliency and planning to combat the threat of climate change? Um, so stewardship and all of capital improvements have to go hand in hand. So in the lower Manhattan, there are all the East Side Coast resiliency projects being implemented. There's ideas of deployable gates and berms. But if they're built and there's no one to maintain them or manage them, what's going to happen to them? They'll crumble and people, it'll just be, you know, futile efforts. And just speaking from the organizational organization experience, um, we still own or co-own two residential buildings right by the waterfront. And so when Hurricane Sandy happened, we were totally flooded, no power. And unfortunately, we just did not have the, the, the the manpower and social plan component at all. And what ended up happening um, was that we had porters working days on end servicing vulnerable senior citizens, servicing um, the families. And it was just all these ethical questions came up, like should they be on site to provide these services? What There was just no plan to structure that around. And so again, if these long-term resiliency projects don't have a social component or the actual uh, manpower component to them, then it's no, there's no resiliency. And even now, it's striking how um, those plans are not, they're just still not present, despite five year, like years after the okay. disaster. I'm sorry, I just want to riff on that, because it's been, um, my, my pet peeve too, hence the stewardship thing, is all the plans that are out there that don't, that and don't have any other um, aspect that gets the, the, the community engaged as the partner, because the resilience thing is a low-hanging fruit. We just screw stuff up and let's try to figure out how to fix it. How about we don't screw stuff up? In other words, do the unthinkable and think about our lifestyle choices and who we vote for and get at the, the crux of the biscuit, which is... The crux of the biscuit? I want that t-shirt. That's a Frank Zappa line. Don't <laughs> no, get that one. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so getting at the, the, at the, cr the crux of it all is... Uh, <laughs> It involves showing, helping communities see the relationship with their world, and it, it's, it's a bigger, it's a bigger move, which is the communities have to be, uh, you know, aware of, of what's going on, where their money goes to. I think you're starting to get at that question about the philosophical question: uh -huh. What about waterfronts yeah. makes it such a complex yet well. rich and promising context for community stewardship? Mm -hmm. um, Matt, did you have something that you wanted to respond to? Well, I kind of speak almost to the other side of that: is that well, we undertook our project, everybody immediately, and I deal with this a lot in a lot of different ways with working on the water, is just as soon as somebody hears that it's on a boat or a vessel, there's that immediate, you know, draw in or, or like clenching of, oh my God, this is so different and and com complex, but it really isn't. It really isn't. It, it <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I mean, yes, there's yeah. some there are some unique components to it and other things that have to be considered, but not anything that's any different than than, than building a, uh, putting a building up or building a home or or you know creating a park. There's 
there's there are guidelines and things that you can go by, but because it's not something that's really done around here as much as it should be, for sure. Or when it is done, you end up with parks and waterfront waterfront uh, promenades that are completely, they might as well be barricades. I mean, yeah. it, 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 to, for, for literally, and I'm not just talking from boats to land, I'm talking from land to boats. You know, there's no there's no connection. It's just like, might as well be looking through, uh, you know, piece of glass. So, um, it's, it's not complex. I mean, yeah. I, I, maybe I'm not answering the question, but it, it is promising in, in that you can, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, potential there. And, but yes, it's all going to require a level of care. It's going to require maintenance. If we go through with any kind of protection or access, you know, there, and that's, there's job creation. There's, there's a lot that goes with that. Just, you know, same with us bringing in vessels. They're going to need a support mechanism. Well, if you have an infrastructure, it needs to support Okay. I would also I would just want to riff on um, a notion that the entrepreneurial spirit can really solve some of the complex issues. And they're typically local issues in the neighborhood. And when you get a group of human beings with talents in maritime, and talents in creating uh, markets and so forth, a lot of the problems that seem complex can be sorted out relatively quickly at no cost to the taxpayer. And that's the big thing, is not to keep on feeding this unsustainable system that we have currently with our public space and the waterfront just to keep on taxing the taxpayer on this. We shouldn't yeah. be doing that. I just want to say, I mean, it, it really is just complex because New York is making it complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I just, it isn't complex, and it shouldn't be complex, and let's get, like, more smart people in the room and figure out why we've invented what complexified it. You know, one of my big inspirations, I'm originally from Brooklyn, from a neighbor that's now called Carroll Gardens. It was right up South Brooklyn then. When I was a teen, one of my uncles uh, found in a boatyard on Martha's Vineyard uh, which designs, builds, and repairs wooden boats. So I learned about boating, not in Brooklyn or New York Harbor, but up um, in Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard Haven. And actually, that harbor is a big inspiration. It's a more working class harbor. It instituted a kind of maritime protection zoning. And so, for example, the Charles W. Morgan, the famous whaler ship from Mystic Seaport, when it visited there last year on its first voyage, I know the folks at Tisbury Wharf, so I asked Noreen Baker, so what were the arrangements like, the negotiations for the Charles Morgan to come? She said, well, they called up. And I said, and? Well, they said when they wanted to come, I looked at the calendar, and I said it was available, and they could come. I said, was there a contract? No, they're Mystic Seaport, done, you know? Uh, I went with Matt, I was volunteering to be a docent when Matt went to um, Mystic Seaport, you know, with the Cornell. I mean, that was a, I saw the contract, it was a much simpler kind of thing. I mean, if I were funded, I mean, it has occurred to me that there might be examples just going up the New England coast to lots of these towns and cities and see how they do things because they are doing the waterfronts that I first learned about were in New England where there's just is not all this complexification like you have a boat and you go to a pier and you call up someone like when my family was we sailed into Portland um, headed to Maine from Martha's Vineyard with a boat that my brother designed and my uncle built, like 45 foot long wooden sloop. We'd come bombing in there ahead of a squall, we'd grab a town mooring, we you know, ride out the squall, and then we decide we have dinner up there, we want to go in for ice cream. So we get in a little dinghy and we go into like the dock from like the fishing supply Chandler house, we just tie up their dock, they have like 20 foot tides, there we go, off this incredibly long ladder, we go into town, we get our ice cream, we come back. In the morning, my brother's heard about this famous greasy spoon local diner, Becky's. He wants to go to Becky's. So my brother's steering the sailboat up and down. He sees a shipyard with a travel lift that has about a, I don't know, 70 foot plastic boat in it. And he calls over and says, We'd like to go to Becky's. Can we talk? He's like, Fine, come in. We love Becky's. So we come in. That was it. No, what's your insurance? No contract. We come in. So we go home. We have breakfast at Becky's. My brother goes across the street to the 7 Eleven, buys the guy a case of beer. He says, Thanks a lot for breakfast. We love Becky's. He goes, Is there a place we can get, you know, provisions? He goes, Ah. Town dock up the way, go back up the channel there, about a half a mile, you can tie up there. So we pull the town dock, which any proper New England town has, we don't have them here. And there's a little sign that says something like, you know, free, free docking for two hours. So we go in, we buy all these groceries, da -da -da -da, and then we leave. We've had four landings between 6, 6 p.m. and 10.30 in the morning. We haven't paid. It's really easy. There's no contract. And there's all this infrastructure. We're spending money. And we're having a great time. You can't do that in New York. You can't do it. Well said. <laughs> so it seems like we all need to take a little uh, check up to the end of the day.
I, I should just make a point that when we went to Mystic Seaport, yeah. they paid us. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it was work. It was you know two and a half days of travel. We had expenses involved, but it wasn't the other way around. Yeah. You pull in somewhere and they go, okay, you know, you want to stay here and do free public programming? Well, that'll be. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. God knows how many zeros. Yeah, and the vice president came down. Yeah, that, that's just an important thing. That it's yeah. it's, it's flip-flop. We're totally flip-flopped here. Um, great. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I want to just give a big round of applause to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for coming.